So I'm uh, very pleased to welcome my colleague, Dr. Thank you. Francisco Noya, who's a pediatrician, works at the Montreal Children's Hospital, and is one of our special selected members to the Academy of Exemplary Physicians in 2023. So Dr. Noya, welcome to this uh, chat and our discussion, and we look forward to learning more about you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, but let me start with my congratulations, my own and of all our colleagues in the faculty and the selection process that you have been chosen as one of the eight special elected fellows, if you will, or members of the Academy in 2023. So um, I'm sure it's an honor that may have surprised you. Can you remember? Uh, yeah, it came out of left field. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, first of all, it, it's a it's a new uh, uh, venture, let's say, uh, yes. of the faculty, and uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I got the notification, and and, and that was, as I say, you know, out of left field. I wasn't expecting this at all, and I was uh, quite surprised. Good. Happily surprised. Happ yeah, of course. You know, it's it's always good news, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Can you tell our, our viewers and listeners a little bit about your career path, the trajectory that brought you to the Children's Hospital and a little bit about the particular kind of pediatric care that you provide? Okay. So... Um, it's uh, I'm about to turn seventy, mm -hmm. so you know, take you back to the uh, uh, early sixties, I guess. Um, when I turned eight years old, that's when I uh, knew I wanted to be a physician. Really? Yeah. And uh, my mother, I think she wanted to be a physician. She never got to. She got married at twenty and became a housewife and uh, proceeded to have six children after mm -hmm. that. Um, and but she was very attuned into she had sort of like a medical mind and mm -hmm. took care of us when we were sick and so on and got us vaccinated when nobody else did uh and so i think that was a uh, um uh, something that stimulated me mm -hmm. um and so when I, I finished high school I, I was a bit young i had just turned 16. Mm -hmm. And I got admitted to the what was considered the best uh, faculty of medicine. I, I'm from Peru. Okay. And uh, so this was in Lima, Peru. And uh, so I went through an admission uh, ex examination. It was uh, like a three-day exam, mm -hmm. like 1,100 uh, 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 candidates right. for 70 spots. And I, I thought, uh, you know, after the exam, I thought I, I didn't get in. And then I left with one of my, with some of my friends to south of Lima to a, a farm to, you know, ride horses and forget about the exams. And then I got a phone call to come back because I, I got admitted. And uh, uh, most surprisingly, I was uh, in fifth place. Mm. You know, so so that was uh, you know I wasn't expecting that. I I didn't think I, I would do like that. So I got into university there. It's a, like an eight year program. Okay. Two years of uh, pre med, mm -hmm. uh, sciences and arts, uh, humanities, and and then a six year of medical school. Mm -hmm. The first two years are um, you don't see patients. Anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, etc. Mm -hmm. I had a hard time with immunology. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then two the following two years is introduction to clinical medicine, where you are in hospitals and and you see patients but don't take care of them, mm -hmm. and uh, medicine, surgery, uh, and so I, I went through those, and the last one was pediatrics. Okay. And I, f at first, I thought I was going to go into internal medicine. Mm -hmm. But when I did pediatrics, you know, it's like the sky's open, you know. Mm. And I said, oh, this is, this is it. This is my calling. So um, then the next two years is, is where you're an extern on the fifth year. You're taking care of patients. 
linked with a, a last year medical student who is the intern right. in pairs, and you have uh, a, a number of patients you take care of uh, in medical wards or whatever the rotation was. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, but I had in mind that I wanted to uh, do specialty training in the States mm. uh, to come back in Peru because they, they, among my teachers, there were people that had gone through that path. Okay. And they added something, you know, uh, uh, beyond what the locals did. Um, not to put them down sure. because, uh, you know, they, they were great teachers and... Um, uh, anyway, so but I wanted to do that, so I had to take more exams to to go to the states and then go through the matching program, and also I was very fortunate to match to a pediatric pro in the University of Miami, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so I did my pediatric residency there. Um, then uh, during my residency, I was sort of like debating whether I wanted to then specialize in infectious diseases right. of children or allergy immunology. Mm -hmm. uh, infectious diseases was something that really was uh, intrigued me very much. But allergy immunology, there was, uh, well, not so much immunology, but allergy, because mm -hmm. I was very what's called a topic as a child. Mm -hmm. As a baby, I had terrible eczema. During my primary school years, I had asthma and, and so on. So I was very intrigued about allergies. And uh, anyway, so I chose uh, to try infectious diseases uh, because my intention was to go back to Peru. Right. And uh, pragmatically, mm -hmm. that was a better choice. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, applied and uh, uh, to some places. Uh, one of the ones uh, I had sent an application was uh, Baylor um, mm -hmm. in Houston, and they had replied that, that, that no, <laughs> you know, they, were, they had no, they wouldn't give an interview. Uh, so I went to interview a few other places, and uh, then when I came back from that round, the, the I got a phone call from Baylor, say, uh, uh, you know, uh, we want to offer you an interview. Because I guess the candidates that they had, had right. you know, decided to do something else, and so mm. they had an opening. So I went, and uh, it, it it really impressed me very much. So I said yes, and that's where I did the infectious disease training. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it was time to go back to Peru, the situation in Peru was really alarming, bad. The, okay. the, 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 there was like thirteen thousand percent inflation. Oh. And uh, a lot of violence. There's uh, a group uh, inspired by the uh, by Pol Pot. Yes, you know uh, the, the insurgency that uh, uh, there was a lot of violence, killings, car bombs mm. in Peru, and so on. So I I said um, maybe I can postpone going back. Right. So I said, hey, why don't I train also in allergy immunology? You know, and I uh -huh. I, I get my other wish. Okay. So I did, and I, I got it at Baylor. So I stayed two more years, and uh, to then go back to Peru. But the situation in Peru actually was worse. Really. So then I decided not to go back to Peru, and I went back to infectious diseases to do a year of research. Mm -hmm. And during that time, that's where I, you know, had the idea of uh, look for opportunities in Canada. Okay. Uh, uh, on infectious diseases, pediatric infectious diseases, and there were four spots available, and uh, two of them I uh, were not going to work, and so that uh, left me McGill and uh, Saskatoon. Mm -hmm. So I came to interview to both places. Right. Uh, Montreal convinced me much more, and they offered me the position, so wow. I accepted. And but I couldn't come right away. I had to wait two years to get my immigrant visa. Oh, okay, to Canada. Yeah. Yeah, and when it finally came, then I moved. That was uh, 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 July 1991, where I joined the children in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And I, I was trying to do lab research, so uh, they gave me a lab in on the fourth floor of the children's, the old children's, to share with Bruce Mazur. Okay, sure. And who Bruce Mazur, he just came back from his fellowship in Denver, and... Uh, to uh, a division that had sort of like imploded. Right. 
So he was it essentially, and he uh, actually built up the, the division from from the ground up. And uh, when we were in the lab, he was always trying to convince me to also join the division. Right. It took four years until finally I did. So since then, I've been split ah, between so infectious both? diseases and allergy immunology. <clears throat> oh, okay. mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, my lab research didn't uh, went as, as well. I <laughs> couldn't get any sure. any funding and so on. So uh, Bruce said, you know, uh, why don't you uh, look into uh, asthma a clinical? There's the, the Children's Hospital had something that was called the Asthma Center, yeah, which uh, sort of like was a uh, one-stop um, shopping place right. for, for asthma for children that was very well-formed and the director was uh, leaving. So uh, I, I started doing that and I started directing the asthma center and, and I became an asthma doctor, which I didn't know mm -hmm. much about before, you know, just really meant really meant. And I did that for 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Until about the move, sort of like uh, the there was something that was called the uh, uh, what was it called it the planned clinic imposed by the Ministry of Health. Okay. Uh, and uh, that did with the asthma program away because uh, the ministry thought that it was too much secondary care and they had no place in the hospital. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And that also caused our division of allergy immunology to curtail their outpatient visits mm -hmm. by 65%. So we had 5,000 visits, outpatient visits at the old children's and when we moved to the Glen, we were allowed only 1,900. Okay. So we had to find somewhere else to see allergy patients which uh, fortunately was adjacent to oh, okay. the hospital on the Maisonneuve, on the other side of the tracks, right. where we had allergy clinics until this year, until unfortunately that the uh, company that actually owned the clinic went bankrupt. Okay. And now we have to move somewhere else, also close to the hospital, because we need that proximity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, so... Um, I have to say my career uh, became very, very clinical. Sure. Uh, patient care. So I would be, uh, you know, a number of weeks of the year on service for uh, infectious disease service, right. doing consults. It's a very active service. Uh, uh, the pediatric ICU, the neonatal ICU, they, n they ask for our help a lot. Sure. Now we have the missiles thing going on right now. Oh, yes. Uh, anyway, so um, other weeks I'm on service for allergy and immunology, uh, uh, you know, which uh, we have to deal with in patient consults. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, I'm not on infectious disease service, then there, I have outpatient clinics. Okay. Uh, and when the, the week that I'm on service for allergy immunology, there I have two morning clinics where we do food challenges or antibiotic oh, okay. challenges. And uh, I'm also in charge of the uh, two sort of like niche allergy clinics. One is vaccine allergy. Okay. And the other is insect uh, allergy. Like, you know, they're allergic to wasps. So these, these are specialty clinics. Yes. And I'm the one who would see the and patients. And you see those patients. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. And... Um, so it's a very active clinical yes. life. Infectious diseases can be a very busy service, right? It is, yes. And the patients are quite sick mm -hmm. when you see them as inpatients. Yeah. So w what does a day of work look like for you? I mean, well, it, today it will, or tomorrow as it an will example? It will depend. So when, uh, let's say, a week that I'm not on service for either infectious diseases or allergy immunology, uh, uh, Monday morning, we start with, uh, 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 we have a, a seminar in allergy immunology yes. that uh, the trainees present on right. a topic. And then I may or may not have a clinic that morning, uh, which would be either my insect or my vaccine mm -hmm. allergy clinic. And then in the afternoon, I go to the outside clinic. Oh, okay. And Monday afternoons is dedicated to amoxicillin challenges. So children that have had a rash with amoxicillin that have been labeled as allergic, uh, okay. which of which only 5% will prove to be allergic. The 95% others really? are not really allergic. So this is what um, uh, Chris Sukas, uh, 
has been uh, <laughs> pushing for, you know, the so-called delabeling sure. of penicillin allergy, yeah. because most people that think they're pen allergic to penicillin are not, so it's a labor to do. Uh, and then uh, Tuesday is sort of like my quiet day uh, that I spend in the hospital, in my office, doing whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, the college, the Royal College uh, has put on, on uh, in operation a lot of evaluations that we do on the trainees, sure. and they accumulate their done electronically, so that that's one day to take care of that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, and, you know, miscellaneous things, you know. Uh, some Tuesday mornings I do have uh, an infectious disease clinic. Okay. This is outpatient. Outpatient. Mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday, every Wednesday morning there is immunology clinic. Okay. At the, chil uh, the hospital. Uh, and the most common referral is a child with recurrent infections, you know. Right. Question, you know, is there an immunodeficiency? Most are not, but we have to do a workup to show mm -hmm, that they're. Mm -hmm. And we pick up some really real immunodeficiencies there. Um, and at noon, there's pediatric ground rounds. Uh, right. on Wednesday, and in the afternoon at one is our weekly infectious disease rounds where, okay. you know, we gather the group and discuss the active patients on the service. Right. It takes two hours. Um, Thursday in morning is the inter-hospital infectious disease rounds that are usually presented by fellows on a topic. Sure. Uh, and then the rest of the morning, I, I'm in my office uh, also uh, filling time. And in the afternoon, I go to the outside clinic to see allergy patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, Friday morning, again, in that same right. clinic, allergy patients. In the afternoon, I go back to the hospital to prepare for the next week. Wow. Uh, I'm very um, uh, OCD in uh, right. the sense that when I have a clinic, before the clinic, like the day before or days before, I have to gather as much information as I can of the patient, particularly if there are new patients. Okay. So I pour over, for example, the electronic medical record, if the patient has been already seen on the children's, what is there. Mm -hmm. Now we have the Dossier de Santé du Québec that we can access electronically that list uh, of, uh, let's say if the patient has, is not a patient of the, of the hospital, uh, I can see medication that has been taken, laboratory oh. tests, x-rays, and so on. So I prepare. I and always you do prepare that my the clinics. day before the clinic. Yeah. You review all the details of the patients you're going to see the next day. Yes. Is that routine or is this no. something that you... No, it's you, me. That's you. It's me. And you've developed it's, it's, that. Why do you do that? Uh, because I, uh, I, I want to be prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes in patient encounters, not everything comes out as much as you want. You know, uh, there are certain important things that are that never come out. Right, right. Uh, but that way, I, I, uh, I can, you know, broach some things. You know, I said, oh, I noticed that, you know, last year you had this operation. You know, what was that about? Uh, okay. You know, things that uh, can be pertinent. And you for, feel better prepared for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. For that, yeah. One of one of the interesting things that many of our colleagues have said is to their practice the importance of listening to patients. That must be a different kind of listening when you're dealing with children. Uh, absolutely. How yeah. how would you describe uh, listening to the parents and listening to the children? Yeah. How are they different? Yeah. So that, how that, do you learn to do it? That, that's that's a, a quite particular aspect of a pediatric practice. Uh, before answering actually that question, but linked to what sure. I was saying before, mm -hmm. uh, I my feeling is about being prepared by having all the external knowledge about the patient, mm -hmm. uh, I have more time to just listen. Right. You know, and, and not be extracting information Mm -hmm. you know, like uh, questionnaire type uh, with a patient. So uh, I spend more time just listening uh, to, to the patient or the parent. In this case, um, I, I think that, that helps me that way. 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, with uh, children, of course, um, you know, the source of information, the conversation is mostly with the parents and uh, mostly with mothers. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's sort of like a stereotype. I would say when uh, the, pa the patient shows up with a father and a lot of times the father is kind of clueless <laughs> about what went on. And uh, fortunately now we have cell phones. So ah. the father says, let me call my wife. Really? And puts the wife on, on speaker and, uh, you know, then then the, the real information comes out. Right. And sometimes it's completely different <laughs> with what the father had said before. Uh, you know, uh, but I say the stereotype because, of course, the fathers that are very involved and, and sure. you know, they, they are not sure. different from the mothers in that way. Uh, and anyway, so for young children, when, uh, let's say, a, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, uh, that will not be part of the interview, right? Mm -hmm. But it's there. And you always have to keep an eye on, on the child, mm -hmm. you know, because you're already examining the child mm -hmm. from a distance. You know, the way they look, the way they act, the way they move, their activities, how they relate <clears throat> uh, to the mother, to me. Uh, and uh, a lot of times what I do is I'm speaking with the mother or the parent, I would say. And uh, I'm keeping an eye on my child. If the child looks at me, I will look at the child and try to engage the child in some way. Okay. You know, uh, children, their engine is play. Right. So I, I usually try to engage them in, in some playful interaction from a distance. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the best is when I get the child to smile, to smile at me and, and they say, okay, yeah, we're, we're onto something here. We've made some progress because that once the interview is over, it comes a part of the physical exam, sure. which <clears throat> may be a challenge because the child could be reluctant, can start crying mm -hmm. and interfere with the assessment. So if I had already have established some sort of rapport with the yes. child, it, it <clears throat> makes it much easier. The child would be more, right. more cooperative and engaged. And, and the physical examination also uh, has to be playful in a way right mm -hmm. so i heard a couple of very interesting things first because you have learned the details of the chart the day before you can listen to the parents or the child if the child is old enough without pushing questions right you can just sit back and let them talk yeah and what kind of information do you get that way that you might not get if you had to ask many questions? Uh, well, mm. you know, uh, you can get more uh, to to learn more about what the parent is concerned about. Okay. <clears throat> which, you know, uh, the my pre-encounter agenda could be different okay. from what the parent has in mind. And uh, the way, you know, we can align them. Uh, the other thing is also a little bit of insurance uh, -huh. uh for example uh in in my antibiotic allergy clinic uh i uh would have already uh, have a list of all the antibiotics that have been prescribed in the last few years okay. with dates and uh the parent will rely on their recollection right you know it was last year it was two years ago um and sometimes it doesn't match, you know, uh, but I have the objective evidence there. Okay. You know, and uh, so also you say, you know, how long did the rash last it? And uh, they will tell me a number of days, um, but um, no, uh, let me track back. If uh, let's say the parents told me, oh, the rash happened on the first day of treatment. Oh, okay. Okay. And then the next day it was changed to another antibiotic. But on my paper, I have that the change of antibiotics was, was four days later. Okay. So that, that will make a difference in my interpretation sure, sure, of the sure. reaction. And uh, so that 
you know, as I say, it's insurance for me of, of getting to make, uh, to the make facts. sure it's accurate. Yeah, the, the factual but part. More interestingly, you say that you have your pre agenda from reading mm -hmm. the chart, but you also need to make sure the parent or child presents their agenda. Right, and if you ask questions too quickly, you interfere with that. Yeah, right? I mean, you're trying to get information, and you may never get to the part, you know, uh, what, what what's on your mind, you know, what, what's worrying yeah, that's you. Right. Uh -huh. That's right, that's right, that's right. So even when you're listening to the mother or father, you are at the same time trying to connect with the child. Yes. Even a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. And see if you can make the child smile which means what? The child has seen you or? Yeah, has seen me and, and uh, you know, uh, the, I may no longer be a threat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, right. Uh, and a lot of times I do to to also get physical contact. Okay. You know, because the, the, they're the other side of the desk. Yes. And the child is sitting on the parent lap and sometimes they, they reach out with their hands, you know, start exploring. So I would go, you know, like, okay, and, and touch the finger, and then pull it back, right? You know, and they look at me, and then I try again, and 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 you right. know, it becomes a game. You're mm -hmm. trying to play a game, yeah, for them to engage with, excuse me, with you and you with them, yeah, and that makes the physical exam easier for yeah. both of you, yeah. And the physical exam, uh, I, I think there's a, a sort of like a tactile component to it, sure. You know, so so putting your hands on the child and, and uh, when examining, when looking, it it's sort of like also uh, has a, a role, you know, not only a connection, but also reassurance. Ah. You know, that it's okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm holding you and, you know. Um, so the child is reassured mm -hmm. that you're not a threat to their well-being. Yeah. Is, is the issue. When you have busy days like that, I guess inpatient can be very busy. Um, and even now you mentioned that with this measles outbreak, things are even more difficult. I guess you haven't seen measles very often in the last 20 years. I, I haven't, but I have a large advantage over most doctors around here Yes. That I have seen measles in the past. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Where, where, um, you know, the younger generations, they have never seen a case. They've never seen it at all. Yeah, they haven't seen measles. They haven't seen chickenpox, and they don't know what it looked like. Wow. Uh huh. And uh, I, growing up in Peru, when I did pediatrics, my pediatrics core in medical school I, I was a part that was done in what uh, a big hospital is called the Children's Hospital in Lima. Right. Hospital del Niño. And there's a, an infectious diseases pavilion okay. that has a measles ward, it had a polio ward, it had a tetanus ward, it had a hepatitis ward, a typhoid ward. And uh, so the clinical exposure was really very, wow. very rich. So you saw children with polio. I did. When you were a student. Yeah. And that must leave an impression that never disappears, right? Yeah, when uh, I was uh, doing, in that hospital, uh, pediatric neurology, Okay. we saw a Friday uh, morning, I remember, a child, uh, like a six-year-old girl, who uh, was having cranial nerve involvement, sort of like acutely, and the neurologist was a very experienced uh, German neurologist. Uh, uh, she said, this is, uh, polio that's uh, involving the uh, cranial nerves, the, the trunk, the encephalic trunk, wow. the, uh, the brainstem. Right. And uh, the patient was admitted. Uh, I went home at the end of the day and I came back on Monday. I wanted to go see the patient and the patient had died during the weekend. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you remember that this is what, 40 years ago? More. Yeah. yeah. More than this, that. Uh, I would say 1976, maybe. Sure. Uh -huh. Almost 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it leaves a lifelong impression. Yes. Something like that.
you know, the last case of uh, polio in uh, the Americas was in Peru. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And now measles is back in Montreal. Yep. And you've seen cases now at the children's. Yeah, I haven't personally so far. Okay. Uh, uh, my colleagues uh, have been involved with a, a couple. And, uh, yeah, the big issue is that uh, with the pandemic, the vaccination rate in children fell. Yes, of course. You know, so the, the desirable level of above 95% children vaccinated, yes. it, it has gone down. And uh, so that opens for spread. Even in Montreal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there are schools, for example, that the rate of vaccination for measles is only like 30%. 30%? Yes. Wow. So that's a serious issue yeah. for the public health system. Mm -hmm. Tell me what this kind of interesting mix of patients that you see, infectious disease, allergy, immunology, immune deficiency, what does a good day at work mean for you? When you get home and you say, today was a good day, what does that mean? Uh, well, it's, um, uh, I think you feel good when uh, you have helped somebody. Yes. You know, which could be a patient, you know, so a uh, difficult case where, you know, you were the one to point at the right diagnosis or, or the right... Uh, therapeutic approach, uh, and um, uh, that happens more often, I would say, in the infectious disease part. Yes. In mm -hmm. allergy immunology, it's a much slower service. So the weekend animal service in the afternoon, uh, you know, it's, uh, I spend much more time with the trainees. Okay. Like they would say they would run on the patient. We had maybe four or five patients Whereas in infectious diseases, you have 14. Right. Right. And so there's mm -hmm. much more time. And I use that time to teach them one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one because we're talking about the patient. And it says, you know, uh, this could be a chronic or unlimited disease. And, and what are we going to do? Are we going to do the DHR test? Right. And do you, I say, do you know what the DHR test is all about? And, and a lot of times they don't. Okay. So we paper and pencil and start writing diagrams and, uh, okay. you know, of uh, biochemical pathways or, or uh, you know, cellular interactions, uh, receptors, yes. uh, et cetera. Uh, and also, I, I want to them to learn what the tests are about, what the test is actually doing. How it works. How it the works. mechanism. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, everybody knows about uh, the TB quantiferon, which, right. uh, and they know the, the acronym IGRA, but they don't know it means interferon gamma release assay. Okay. And what you're actually measuring is interferon gamma by an ELISA after a cellular reaction has occurred, right. you know, an immunologic uh, uh, Response. antigen recognition and activation of T cells and so on. And so go through that step by step. And uh, so I spend a lot of time in that sort of like more ample time that there is to okay. do that uh, to, to, to teach, you know. And, and whom are you teaching, Dr. Noy? Is it medical students or residents in the specialty or in pediatrics or is it? Yeah, so it's all of them. All of them. All of them. Uh, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, an infectious disease rotation, there would be an infectious disease fellow, uh, one or two pediatric residents, and uh, one or two medical students. Okay. In allergy immunology, uh, there's always fellows, and uh, they may be uh, pediatric residents or dermatology residents rotating through immunology. Okay, right. uh, a few weeks ago, I was on service with uh, respirology. Resident sure. doing a rotation in allergy immunology, so I, I, you know, I do the teaching all. I have to sort of like adjust it to their level, sure, because I sure. cannot go, in, you know, teach the same way I teach a, a fellow, right? Uh, that would I would a medical student, and that with medical students that made me realize how blessed I was with the education I got in my medical school with a longer uh, program. Okay. That, I mean, to this day, I know 
more anatomy, let's say, than my colleagues. Okay. Because we spend much more time doing yes. anatomy. And uh, on the basic sciences as well. You know, I, I feel that I got uh, quite a solid background yes. that has served me well. To, to even to yeah. now. Yes. Right. Yes. And when I speak with medical students, you know, I give them a lecture every year. And when they're two years later, they, when they come to rotate with me, they, they don't remember that they have yes. lectured them. <laughs> they forgot. They forgot. <laughs> yeah. They don't even recognize me. Uh, uh, you know, and of course, they don't remember anything about, you know, when I spoke about Bruton's disease or severe combined mm -hmm. immunodeficiency. Okay. And it's like, you know. But you enjoy teaching. Yeah, I do. How do you connect teaching with looking after patients? How do you put those together? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, uh, back in the late 90s, I became what was called a teaching scholar. So it was okay. a program that faculty development had yes. for a year. So it's high level learning and people go on to get like masters on, on this. Sure. And, um, uh, but for me, it was more for me, right. learning for me rather than to produce something. And uh, so with time, I got to marry it with the clinical practice. Right. And the, most of the teaching that I do, of course, I do a, a lecture in, you know, to the first year students and, and uh, to residents and so on every now and then. But the teaching that I do most and what I, I think I do better is, is more one-on-one. -on -one. With the patients, with with the patient or uh, around the patient, and uh, so sitting down, thinking, you know, the, the clinical reasoning process, uh, fleshing it out, bringing it out to the table. Okay, uh, you know how you connect this with this, and um, and then uh, w what I was saying before, like with the uh, in allergy immunology, with going back to to basics a little sure. bit. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you go back to basics a lot to help the trainees understand the diseases, the patients, and the tests, yeah. as you were saying as well. Yeah. I um, went, and at the time, now it's done electronically, but at the time that we did paper consultations, ah. you know, you're familiar with the, those forms with the orange line on the bottom. And uh, I noticed that there was a method here at McGill and I call it the McGill consult. Oh, no, yeah. sorry, the McGill line. Because what people would do is uh, in the middle of the page, they would draw a line. Okay. And below the line, they would write their uh, history, physical examination. They usually had to go to a second page and so on. And they left the top for the impression and plan. Ah. Uh, but a lot of times, the space is not sufficient. was not sufficient. And so that cut in whatever you had to write there. Huh. So I, I think that hamper, you know, the clinical thinking, the clinical okay. reasoning that was supposed to be shown in the impression. Okay. So I, I, I would tell, don't do that line, please. Right. You know, go to a second page or, you know, whatever, but leave you, don't limit yourself okay. physically. <clears throat> in what you need to to put down. Now that's electronic, that's no longer a problem. So in the electronic record, do people take the time to explain their reasoning and give the details of their thinking or <laughs> not, not not always, right. but that's something that I <laughs> I really strive for. You know, I what I tell them is you know, the the console is going to be a lot of data, <clears throat> right? But the most important part, where the money is, is your impression. Yes. In which you have to make manifest, you know, transparent, your clinical reasoning. Yes. Of what you think is going on. Yes. And then the plan has to flow from flow from there. Yes. Yes. It has to be completely linked, and and that's where the money is. And the rest is just data, right? You know that you're reproducing from somewhere else, and uh, 
Uh, so it's much less important, you know, because people they, they spend much more time with that and, yes. and just, you know, uh, fudge with the impression and, and plan. And you find that people were not putting enough emphasis yeah. on explaining their impression, right. their reasoning, and, and, and why and, they recommend it. Or and one thing that I tell them not to do is uh, when they write impression slash plan. Ah. That no, they should be separate. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing <clears throat> that I became convinced in the last several years of my career is the importance of the medical record. Mm. And uh, because it's permanent. Yes. Right? And it's, it's you know, uh, if you think from a patient point of view, it's your record, and it's going to be like that forever. Sure. In, in, invariable. So on the other side, you know, we as physicians, uh, we have to give a lot of respect to the medical record. Hmm. You know, treat it with a lot of respect and do the best we can so that it, you know, that it's, it's the best record that can be for that patient. Right. Uh, there's so many errors uh, that are, and and nowadays with electronics, uh, with electronic medical record, there's a lot of cut and pasting, mm. and that a, a lot of times don't make sense. You know uh, that you see uh, on today's note, somebody something that was pasted from the other note that say uh, the next appointment is will be in in you know January. 2023, mm -hmm. and we're in March 2024, you know, so, uh, and you don't put that in the March 2024 notes. Exactly. You know, the next appointment. And, but that's a silly example, but there's, sure. uh, you know, more um, uh, ones that ha can, ha can have consequences. So what things do you recommend to trainees and maybe to colleagues to make the medical record a more valuable document? Because you're describing we don't appreciate its value sufficiently. And what do you teach them? It, so what I, I tell them is, is that you need to, to, um, to be present at that moment. You know, when you're writing a history, you have to be present and forget that, you know, what are you going to do next, right? And look at what you're writing and make sure that it reflects what you really want to say wow. now and uh, what you know so that think of what people are going to read the users of that right. okay you know what do you want them to see <laughs> you know that 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 should be your your guiding uh so you write the medical record the history for example like a author does with the reader in mind. Yes. Right? Yes. So I, uh, there's two uh, focuses yes. that I think very important for me. The first one is the patient. Yes. You know, so our work has to be absolutely focused on the patient. Okay. Okay? That's number one. And then our sort of like formal medical <clears throat> word, like our written record, is the focus is in the audience for what you're writing. Your colleagues or the yes. next position. Right, or, or the nurses or nurses, you know, the, anyone. The, the healthcare workers that, that are sure. going to read that. So tell me a little bit more. I understand the record part now. Tell me a little bit more about the first when you say, my first principle is the focus is on the patient. What does that mean in real day-to-day -day work? Um, Maybe I can give you an example of, of something of that, uh, relatively recent. So uh, on Monday mornings, I could have e my insect or vaccine clinic, and uh, those are not a lot of patients, and uh, uh, there's no waiting lists right. for that. So uh, they have to be booked more on demand, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the requests come in. So... Uh, you know, I, in advance, I set the dates, but I don't know what they're going to be in them. Okay. Right? In those clinics. Who's going to populate that yes. clinic? Which patients are going to populate that clinic? So it depends on the demand. Now, 
the hospital has a centralized appointment system. Uh, it's called the ARC, the Appointment Resource Center, mm -hmm. which was a very bad idea from the beginning because it doesn't work. It's very dysfunctional. And uh, so uh, they use an electronic system in which for a clinic, you have to uh, have a template right. of slots and times, right? But the template that for my vaccine patients and my uh, insect patients may not be the same. Sure. So when it comes down to the wire, and I say here, this Monday, uh, we have two vaccine patients and we have two insect patients. And then there's, uh, you know, they, they don't know what to do. They said, which template do I apply? Okay. You know, I said, you know, this, this is too rigid. You know, this uh, calls for flexibility. Yes. Because this is not patient-centered care. Ah, uh, okay. Right? It's, it's bureaucratic. Yes. And it's not serving the patient. You know, you're taking care of the bureaucratic part, you know, what has been yes, said. Yes. And you're not serving the patient. So how do you change the system? Because many patients and families complain. They're asked to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they're not seen till 11.30. So how would you change the system, even for that simple question, to think of what the patient and the family needs and not what the bureaucracy needs? What would you recommend? Well, I, I think uh, uh, get rid of centralization, for example. Okay. You know, uh, in the old times, each division had their own appointment way. Yes. And they had a person who was in charge of scheduling who got to know the ins and outs, the particularities, the needs sure. of that particular service. And uh, that, you know, got flushed away with the creation of a centralized system, sure. the ARC. In, and, and that has caused all these problems. Right. Plus, the ARC is always uh, under-resourced, uh, lacking more personnel, sure, sure. and so on. So, so on top of the bureaucratic uh, uh, ankylosis, I would say, <laughs> right. there's uh, there's added layers of, right. of dysfunction. Right. Uh, I, I think it should go back to the departments uh, because they yeah. know better. With more flexibility. How to make it work, and, and it can be right. more flexible. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing inpatient care, especially sick children with infectious diseases, and how do you make that, what's in your mind to make that care patient and family-centered? What, what do you try and think of to make sure you don't forget? Or what do you teach the trainees to make sure they don't forget? Um, well, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's you know, on, on the moment. I, I don't think I have a method, okay. you know, or, or at least it's not, you know, uh, deliberate on the surface. Sure. Uh, but it's, it's more in when we are talking about the patient, uh, uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, to say, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but you know, is, is that? Do you think this is what's best for these patients? Right. You okay. know, because of this or this or that. You know, okay. to to bring that awareness that right. that you know that you have to focus on the need of this patient, different from you know a from anyone patient else. Or, uh -huh. but, and you said even when you're writing the chart. You need to keep be in the moment and focused and think about the patient and about the person who's going to read right. your consultation yes. or your note. You have trained in many places, right, and with a very great array of people who are your teachers. Are there some who stand out for you as having been a special influence on how you work and how you think? Mm -hmm that steered you in certain yeah. pathways? So um, 
Uh, I guess the first one was in when I was first year medical student, which was our histology professor. Wow. Who was a very tough guy, and uh, we trembled uh, with him, but he taught us so much, and I learned more physiology from the histology course wow. than the, from the physiology course the next year. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that made me appreciate uh, the basic science, the basic science knowledge sure. that we need for a medical career. Uh, the other was uh, the um, uh, who trained me in infectious diseases, the uh, chief of infectious diseases at Baylor, mm -hmm. Earl Bakers, is now retired. Uh, although she's still active trying to get uh, conjugate um, polysaccharide vaccines against group B strep. Wow. For uh, women, mm -hmm. you know, to prevent uh, group B strep neonatal disease. Okay. Uh, which, you know, she's, <clears throat> it's been 30 years coming and for different sort of issues it has not, didn't come, has not come to fruition. It right. will, I think in the next several years, it's going to happen finally, you know. 20 years after pneumococcal vaccines, you yes. know, similar vaccines okay. came to, to, to market. Uh, anyway, she, I, I learned from her the, <clears throat> the clinical method. You know, uh, a, a lot of the things that I uh, talked about today, I think uh, the, the, the roots of that are what I've learned from her. Okay. You know, she's the kind of person that... Um, with, a, with a focus on, yeah. again, what you were talking mm -hmm. about. And finally, what do you see in your own fields, both fields that you are active in are rapidly developing. The, the treatment methodologies have revolutionized since you've started. Uh, it's not only new antibiotics, it's new kind of methodology, diagnostics. Yeah, what, I'm, what I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit left behind, you know, particularly in immunodeficiency. Mm -hmm. Because with the genetic uh, revolution, I would say, yes. uh, there has been an explosion. Uh, when I was a, a fellow, probably there would be maybe 20, no more than 30 known immunodeficiencies. Right. And uh, now there are about 500, wow. of which half have only been described in the last 10 years. Mm. You know, so it's it's a logarithmic uh, rise, right, 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 and actually have a slide of that. <laughs> with uh, yeah. um, next week, uh, in a couple of weeks, I give the uh, adaptive immune efficiency lecture to sure. first year medical students, um, and I do it back to back in English and French for the Gatineau, Ottawa. Uh, the Ottawa uh, program. Uh, anyway, um, so I I, I uh, it's escaping out of my hands, the knowledge, you know, it's impossible to, to master it, you know, mm -hmm. the way I was used to. Uh, and, uh, you know, I feel I'm always behind, uh, which is, it's a big challenge. Uh, yes. uh, fortunately I don't have a lot of years of practice left. So, <laughs> you know, the, no, I will not need to, to, to continue to try sure. to, to keep up, you know, uh, but it, it's 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 been uh, quite a change. Yes, uh, uh, we work very differently now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and before it was um, more mechanistic, you know, our investigations that we did on on patients. Uh -huh. And uh, two things have happened. Two was is this progress now with uh, making the diagnostic uh, diagnosis uh, genetically. Yes. Uh, but the other thing is we have lost the ability to do these mechanistic tests because the laboratory systems, uh, like in the hospital, yes. have been letting go of those tests, you know, particularly with OptiLab, yes. which yeah. I call SubOptiLab, right. uh, which is, the, is, again, centralization of laboratories, uh, which uh, I think undermines um, the service to the patient. Do you uh, think that with this explosion of lab tests and genetic testing, do you think that the capacity of clinical examination of the patient has decreased the skill sets? Well, you I, 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 you know, uh, this is something that uh, uh, when I um, 
seeing a patient with a fellow, the fellow will see the patient first and um, then we'll discuss the patient, then we'll go back and, and uh, see mm -hmm. the patient together. Uh, but a lot of times a physical examination has not been done. Really? You know, which uh, I think uh, we can miss a lot that way. <laughs> I said, you didn't examine the patient? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm gonna go examine the patient. Okay. Uh -huh. And you think that's because of testing and? Uh, yeah, uh, there's less emphasis on the right, physical exam. Okay. And uh, what the end result, that happened with lumbar punctures as well, that uh, residents, they uh, don't get the skills. Okay. Because they're not doing it enough. Okay. You know, because uh, this uh, this things are is practice to do them over and over and over again, and that's how you you know get skilled at them. So they don't have the opportunity, yeah, to do all the learning. So even though there's so many many more syndromes and diseases, the clinical skills are still there and they're valuable, and they're still your foundation. I, I think so. I, I think they should never be let go. Right. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. You're welcome. So much for sharing the time and more importantly, your own memories of how you got to this wonderful career and to become selected as an exemplary physician. And so, thank you for letting us have some insight into how that developed and to the work that you do and how you do it. So, Thank you very much for joining us and for your patience and And I, I have to thank you not only for the opportunity and the pleasure for this interaction, but also uh, as uh, for me, in the sense that, you know, I didn't prepare for this. Of course. And, uh, you know, so it's whatever came out. And, uh, but that will give me a lot of uh, points to reflect on. Good. I'm mm -hmm. glad it helped both of us. In that way. Thank you very much. You're welcome.